eyewitness accounts of D-Day. Tonight on American Experience. All was quiet. The ships were gone. The planes were gone. The roads were empty. The tanks were gone. And all these hundreds of Americans and that that had been milling around our city were gone. And then this silence. And the waiting. England. The spring of 1943. The American ships began to arrive in great numbers. Some had seen combat in North Africa and Sicily, but most were untested, fresh from the training camps of North America. They were here to join an allied army, to become part of the largest invasion force in history. Seeing them, the British were encouraged by their numbers. The island had been at war for four long years, and now the Americans had arrived. But the war had been going on for 39. They, they were tired. Particularly their soldiers, they had been fighting a very long and difficult war. It did not take long for a visiting American to become aware of the nearness of war. The most devastating effect was probably on the services who were away, came on leave and no house, no wife, no children, and they hadn't been told. On January 16th, 1944, General Dwight D. Eisenhower arrived in England to assume supreme command of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. He had not led troops to combat, but he possessed an extraordinary talent for planning and military diplomacy. He's really chairman of this great Allied committee. Marvelous at that. His initial move was to appoint his deputies, all British. But he was careful to keep by his side his most trusted field commander, the American General Omar N. Bradley, a solid, able, self-effacing soldier. If you look at the team of extrovert prima donnas he was trying to run, the way he kept them all together was quite an astonishing fact. I mean, you couldn't have a more prima donnaish man than uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, a bloody good soldier. But he was a very difficult man. Eisenhower faced a task of magnitude and hazard never previously attempted. Weapon for weapon, tank for tank, save transport and artillery, the Germans outclassed his army. An army he would have to move up to 100 miles across the English Channel and storm a heavily fortified coastline.
Added to this, he would have to endure a difficult British commander and keep a balanced mind toward his real adversary. The man the Allied forces would have to face on the beaches of Normandy was Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, one of the most brilliant generals of the war. In December of 1943, he was appointed by Hitler to command German army units in northern France to hurl back the Allies if they landed there. Inspecting the huge fortifications at Calais, less than 30 miles across the English Channel from Britain, he found the defenses formidable. The beaches of Normandy, however, were a different matter. The high tides and treacherous cliffs were to his advantage but the guns and fortifications at Normandy were too few and far between. Still, Normandy was 70 miles from Britain, and moving an army that distance over difficult seas implied great risks. The only hope that Rommel had, and he knew it, was to have a, a force ready to move immediately towards the spot where anybody landed. He knew that. He immediately ordered the emplacement of tens of thousands of underwater obstacles. And though he intended to inflict heavy casualties on the landing craft, he was convinced success lay in attacking the enemy with armor on the beaches. Beaches in England, Scotland, and Wales, similar to those in Normandy, were found for training. Eisenhower and Bradley chose the 29th, 4th, and 1st Infantry Divisions to make the initial assault. The three divisions that would waged the fight for the first thousand yards. Only one, the first division, had ever been in combat. In other parts of Britain, Ranger units trained to destroy coastal gun positions. We climb all the cliffs of southeast and southwest England. We climbed a lot of cliffs. We lost some good men. Tried American 101st and the veteran 82nd Airborne were chosen with the British 6th Airborne to be the first troops to land in the invasion. They were first class O's, 82nd Airborne. They were spot on. Much of the success of the first day would depend on the skill and bravery of small groups of men able to take things into their own hands. But there was no mistaking where the advantage of the lies lay. We just had to run out our ears. Some of it wasn't as good as the German, but boy, we had plenty of it. Half of England was under tarps. We like to sink that island. 
We had more Americans than they had British. Man, they were everywhere. And we liked each other and really cared about each other. It's a wonderful counterforce to the terror of being alone in battle. The man alone in Britain in the spring of 1944 was General George S. Patton. He had been assigned to lead an army that did not exist. And Patton was furious. Patton was just livid. Patton was in command of a fictitious army intended to deceive the Germans into believing it was going to invade France at Calais, the shortest distance from Britain, less than 30 miles across the channel from Dover. They actually moved units of, of a phantom army all around England without moving anything. We'd recorded the sounds of tanks moving along, the squeaking noises. Our tanks were absolutely marvelous. They were splendid. Because hundreds of lives were depending on this. The patent deception worked in great part because of what the British had accomplished earlier in the war. Behind Bletchley House, a Victorian mansion north of London, stood Hut 6. Here a team of British and American cryptographers deciphered coded messages. Codes the Germans believed unbreakable. They never suspected it. We were doing enormous amount of eavesdropping. We could quite often deliver a signal to Eisenhower, Bradley, or whoever, within two and a half hours of the time the Germans had sent it out. We had indications where the enemy was, what he was doing the reaction of Hitler to various things and the arguments going on. We knew well, almost exactly what they were doing. But the Germans were doing things on the Norman beaches the Allies knew little about. And Allied commandos, some of them foreign nationals, were put ashore at night to find out. We did the one reconnaissance on the British beach, and then we did this on Omaha beach, getting a closer view of um, what the defenses are looking like. The crucial thing uh, was to check this beach bearing capacity. They took infrared pictures while avoiding German patrols. They found us captured, and they discover that you're Hungarian. They hang you on the spot. So that's why I always pretended to be a Welshman. We uh, then had to ease our way out, looking as much like seals as possible. Equally important was the information radioed to Britain at great personal risk by the Maquis, the Free French, who were being supplied by the Allies at night. 
the Mackie would put three lights out and they would stand at the downwind end usually and they'd flush the letter of the day. And if they flushed the correct letter, you would drop. In the early spring of 1944, orders went out to the Allied airfields to target the French railroads and transportation system to cut off the Germans at the French beaches from supplies and reinforcements. For 18 months, Allied bombers had concentrated on destroying German industry, often suffering heavy losses. Now the heavy bombers joined the mediums in missions against specific targets in France, in direct support of the coming invasion. They were the horses, we were the hounds. To see them in massive uh, formations was quite staggering. It required a degree of uh, uh, flying skill that, that we never really collected. It was so comforting when you come up over the coast and all of a sudden you look out and you see a couple of fighter planes on either side of you. Uh, I used to love them. A hundred Messerschmitts attacked six Spitfires. The Spitfires would meet them head on. Same thing with P-51, sometimes P-47. They never ran. Before the Allied landing in France, the German Air Force had to be destroyed. In the spring of 1944, over Germany, the Allied pilots shot down 1,300 fighters. could concentrate on the river bridges and rail yards in an attempt to keep the Germans from moving supplies from Calais to Normandy and from Paris to the sea. The attack fighters were out to destroy anything that moved. All over the place, part of Calais, Cape Green, eh? all over the place. They didn't want to identify where the landings were going to take place. We had timetables of trains which we got from the resistance. you get the hell shot out of you. 50% or more. We got very well with the Americans, I will say that. You know the saying about American soldiers in England? Overpaid, oversexed, over here. They always had a smile and they were always cheerful and always uplifting and saucy. I can't remember kissing him. But it was an understood thing that at the end of the war we would be married. There were so many people that met, laughed, and parted. A 
that when we go in on this invasion, it's not, it's gonna be the greatest show on earth. He just laid it on the line and told us what to expect. And he said, now, however, just remember that, he said, some of us is going in there and maybe don't come back. You know, when you go to war, somebody don't come back. week in May, thousands of American and British troops and vehicles moved to the Channel ports. It was quite obvious to everyone that something very serious was afoot. Because we became saturated with men. Just waited, sweated it out. They were confined and under tight security. A staggering weight of secret orders was unsealed. They knew at the briefing that this was the invasion. Every bomb crater was shown, every ditch, every stile, every fence. There was a scale model of the beach built to exact proportion. So we, we all studied it to the point where we knew exactly every house, every defile, every everything. We knew what we were, where we were going. They now learned they would not be going across the 30 miles of the channel at Calais. The British 50th and the 3rd Infantry and the Canadian 3rd would land opposite the French cities of Bayou and Caen. The American 4th would go in at the beach code named Utah, while the American 29th and 1st Infantry would take Omaha. The 2nd and 5th Rangers would be given the task of silencing the guns on top of the cliffs at Pointe de Hoc, flanking Omaha. It was no secret to the Germans that an invasion was imminent. But there were storms over the channel, and air reconnaissance had picked up no evidence of allied activity. On June 4th, Rommel arrived home to celebrate his wife's birthday. He had brought her a pair of shoes from Paris. On June 8th, he planned to see Hitler at Obersalzburg and to persuade Hitler to give him command of all armored divisions in Normandy. Hitler was not anxious to see Rommel. He did not trust him, he had told others, and was more determined than ever to keep control over Rommel's armored divisions himself. In England, the loading of the ships that would carry the vast army across the sea to Normandy continued. Enough armament to support the 25,000 men who would make the initial assault. And the 125,000 who would soon follow. And everybody saying, uh, God bless you. Give him hell. ships in the same order they would storm the Normandy coast. Less than 15% of the men coming aboard had ever seen combat. 
She said, you're going to see a show. You're lucky to be in an invasion like this. But it's going to be, and it's going to be more ships participate in this than any place that's ever been in the world. We're going in to win. There's no, there's no coming back. And he left the ship. It didn't make no difference if you, you were Jewish, Italian, Irish, whatever you were. It didn't make no difference. They all wanted to hear the word. It was a way of saying, okay, get right with your maker, regardless of who you believe in. Make yourself right with him. Look up at the church, the school, look at the fields. Take it all in. You'll never see it again. was to go on June 5th, but a storm forced postponement. At Suffolk House near Portsmouth, Eisenhower had to decide. There must have been about, I don't know, 15 of us there. The two great men were there, the Monty and Eisenhower. The poor weathermen had to talk first. Eisenhower asked Monty what he felt. It's all right. I'll do whatever you say, you know, we're ready. Then Eisenhower, very calmly, said, we'll go. June 5th. The largest naval armada in history sailed for Normandy. The minesweepers was first. They went in there first. One of our submarines went there and, and laid a, a line for us, little green lights. Battleship Nevada, Texas, and Arkansas went in there. And then there was three British battleships went in. The channels were joined up together to one huge sort of motorway. Because it really was rough. Oh, God, it really was rough. They were throwing up their guts. My whole battalion came from uh, Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska. They hadn't done much sea travel. But I was sick the whole way across, hoping and praying that the boat would sink. Get us off these ships. I don't care what's waiting for us. A lot of guys said, oh, I know I'm not coming back. I said, I never entertained such a thought. I know I'm going back. One to my grandmother, one to my fiance. Look, if you don't hear from me in the next six weeks or so, don't think nothing of it. Because I'll be busy. At 
At 10.30 p.m., with the invasion armada en route to Normandy, the Supreme Commander visited the 101st Airborne. He didn't tell us where we were going. That he had a lot to thank us for, and will have much more to thank us for after this. The 101st and 82nd were to drop behind enemy lines and secure the road exits leading off Utah Beach. Destroy and hold the bridges over the Douve and the Murderay Rivers. And capture the crossroad town of St. Mary Glees. I lined up all the pilots. I said, I don't give a damn what you're doing, but for one thing, if you're gonna drop us in hell, or if you're gonna drop us on our zone, drop us all in one place. It was 11.15 p.m. They were now part of the largest sky train ever assembled. Eight hundred and twenty-two C-47s, carrying 13,000 paratroopers. as far as you can see behind you and look up ahead and see C-47s as far as you can see ahead of you. Crossing the coast, they could see six British Horsa gliders. Towed by C-47s, they carried 180 British assault troops. Their task was to capture the Khan Canal and Orn River bridges and preserve a link between the British airborne troops and those advancing from the beach. In the moon, I could see just a hoax. Down there, we flew right over the invasion fleet. When we crossed the coastline, I started pulling down and yelling at the men, you know, that we were crossing. You can see the white of the beaches below us. They went into this cloud cover or fog bag. Some went above it, others went down below it. The pilots gunned it. I sensed that there was something wrong. Then it just tore the equipment right off of it. supposed to be. Troopers were scattered everywhere. Dick, is that you? He says, yes, sir. He says, sir, and I says, he says, how close I came to shooting you. A lot of them were right down through the marshes and, and uh, never found. That's where they drowned. It was dead paratroopers everywhere. And they were just shot by the Germans hanging there. They could see the gliders that had come in during the night. 
I saw a two-star general lying there just dead as you could be. I know their survival rate couldn't have been 25%. Germans were everywhere. We were outnumbered. Communications to Cherbourg had been cut. Some rail and road bridges remained in enemy hands. Other objectives were difficult to hold. We had made up our minds that no one was coming through that roadblock. But the Utah beach exits and the bridgehead over the Douve had been secured. And the first French town of the war had been liberated. It was a terrible day for paratroopers. But they did some terrible fighting in there, and, and they, they really made their presence known. The bombardment of the beachhead started, and it sounded like rolling thunder, and you could even feel the ground shaking from it, even though we were five miles inland. My God, those kids are going to be hitting that beach. into high seas, 11 miles from shore. No cops, none of them, knew where they were heading. You know, after being tossed around, they headed for a piece of land. Germans uh, could see us out to sea, but we couldn't see the shore. The heavy shells coming over our heads, it was a terrifying sound.
machine gun bullets were just hitting the front of it. Because when you knock that ramp, the machine gun just right into it. I was the first one. First one across. Matter of survival. It was just the idea to get behind something, get off that beach. They just saw him get almost cut in half. Confusion, total confusion. We were just being slaughtered. British were experiencing terrible inflating fire and heavy losses of tanks and landing craft on the obstacles. But it was on Omaha Beach where the carnage was taking place. The swimming tanks were sinking and none of the heavy armor was getting ashore. The poor guys, they died like sardines in a can, they did. They never had a chance. to do with anything on that beach. You were just clinging. Not by unit, not by role. Everybody individually almost did what they had to do. Would it help to go in closer? And yes, it sure would. smoke, flashes, anything. I wasn't around, but I damn nearly was. How come they're gonna kill us all? Said we're too close to this beach. Tank positive, man. Get up, move in. You're gonna die anyway, move in and die. With no more orders than to move forward and stay alive, mixed units and individuals, one by one, took things into their own hands. German first line of defense had been breached. We were recreating from this mass of twisted bodies, a fighting unit again. And it was done by soldiers, not, not by the officer. Troops were inland, not far, but inland. It was just mortars and rifles. The 1st and 29th Divisions had fought yard by yard to get a mile and a half off the beaches. The 4th Division from Utah was in four miles, and with the help of tanks had made contact with the airborne troops of the 101st. The 
British and Canadians had advanced six miles and could see the gliders that had landed less than 50 yards from the Khan Canal Bridge. It was time to add up the cost. Over 9,000 had been killed or wounded that day. This is what dying is like. The feeling that, you know, the rest of my life is a, like a free bonus. When I was relieved and I walked by, oh God, the guys have died that day. All those beautiful, wonderful friends of mine. The day before, the night before, kidding and joking. The exits were all in, were all secure by noon. place was alive with stuff coming ashore it was just backing up it was all over the place never stopped it was un unbelievable but it was a scene of un as if the hand of god had just strewn all the debris in the world over you know, rubble and, uh, and bodies and trucks moving, uh, roads being built, all of that that was happening. They were bringing the wounded down from the base of the hill. Unlike the morning, the sea was welcoming. As if it were paying its respects to the men who had fallen. Who, out of a nation of millions, had been selected for reasons only known to fate. To represent us on the beach that day. If one cared to listen, the sound of gunfire could be heard. But to those who were leaving and those who remained and had witnessed the day, it was time to remember in silence. It was over. I mean, it, it, it it was quiet, as if nothing had happened. We went, the beach was not any general's business. They had no say. None whatsoever. It would have made no difference who commanded us in those first hours. None. But there was something about it. The, the the essential feeling of being there on that beach. None of us will shall ever forget it. more about D-Day at American Experience Online. Read letters sent home from the front. Access a World War II timeline. 
and see what paratroopers carried in their 70-pound packs. All this and more at PBS Online, pbs.org, America Online, keyword PBS. Educators and other organizations may purchase a video cassette copy of American Experiences D-Day by calling PBS Home Video at 1-800-PLAY-PBS.